Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. I do pray, Father, that you would just prepare our hearts for your word this morning, Lord. We're not here just to just to hear a, a fancy message, Lord, but we're here because we want to draw closer to you, Father. There's something that we need this morning from you, Lord. We may not even know what it is, Father, but we pray, Lord, that you would just fill that need of ours, Lord. Grow us deeper in our relationship with you, Father, that you would just touch us, Lord, and uh, remove the distractions from us, Lord, so that we can pay attention. In Jesus' name, amen. So last time I taught on Sunday, I taught in 1 Timothy, and I was in chapter 3. Timothy is in Ephesus. He's uh, stepping in as a, the pastor there or the overseer because he's setting up some leadership in that, in that church there. And while he's there in Ephesus, he receives this letter from Paul. Now, Paul had ministered in this area of Ephesus for three years, which is the longest recorded stay of Paul and in any church, uh, three years on a, on a missionary journey. That's, that's the length of time that we have recorded for his stays. Um, but he was in this city, and Ephesus was a seaport city. It's, it's on, on the coast. And so Ephesus was the perfect place for trade. People would come and go, bringing things in with ships and hauling it around. It's very populated with people traveling all over the known world at that time. And it's also home to the great Artemis or Diana. It's this great statue. It's one of the seventh wonders of the world still. So if you looked up uh, this great goddess, Diana, you're going to see some pictures of this area. But this city had all kinds of different beliefs. They believed in, in all kinds of different gods. And there was uh, all sorts of superstitious, that, superstitious things that went along with it. They had religious practices. They had temple prostitution. And when Paul brought the gospel to Ephesus, because it was located where it was, the message was able to spread throughout the whole world. Uh, those who received the message and believed in Christ, they were surrounded by this worldly influence but they're also able to make a huge impact for the Lord because of the location and, of course, because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Acts 19.9 says, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed, speaking of Paul, from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jew and Greek. So you can see that the message had spread easily around Asia at that time. And Paul had grown to have a deep love for these guys. So we have here a letter to Timothy, one of his closest disciples, he calls him a son, who he sent to Ephesus to strengthen the body, to encourage the believers, and to help to get the church back on the right track. See, Timothy was to stand against the influence of the culture outside and deal with the false teaching that had gotten into the church. And one of the first things Paul wrote to Timothy was, command some not to teach falsely anymore. So apparently there were some people in the body who were teaching things that went against what the gospel tells us, what the word of God tells us. See, these false teachers, uh, most likely they're Jews, they were, they were sharing things that went against his word. They were trying to put the people back under bondage, tell them there's things that they need to do in order to be right with the Lord. See, the reason that we need to get rid of this false teaching is because what happens when you allow it to continue to go on is that people fall away. So it's very important that we stick to the Word of God. 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 7 says, From which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. See, seven times in this letter, Paul tells Timothy about this group of people that have fallen away and they're going to lead others to turn away if they're not stopped. And because of this false teaching, it says that some have already done that. They've already left the faith. They've already turned away. So Timothy is to stand up to these false teachings, and he's to make sure that he sticks to the Word of God and the apostles' teaching about Jesus Christ. That's why he's there. You know, this church, he needs to put it back on track. Paul was there for three years. I know many of you have been here at church longer than three years, but that's all he was there with, and this body of believers took off and started going from there and starting new groups, uh, taking the message to other places. 
So he's writing to help this church. He sent his, his closest guy, Timothy, and uh, he's trying to get the church back on track. See, already he's addressed how men and women are to be handling themselves in church. He's uh, told Timothy how he's supposed to appoint leaders and deacons, uh, the leadership in the church. And so he writes to Timothy and tells him what the qualifications and the leaders would be or what they needed to have in order to possess, to fulfill this role in the body, what he should be looking for. And so he's put on his heart certain people, the desire to be in a place of leadership. You know, there's people in the body right now that might have a desire to be a part of the leadership, maybe to be a deacon, and he's put it on their hearts. Now, there are good leaders and there are bad leaders, and Timothy needs to find the good ones, and the role of a pastor, it says, is a good thing. Now, this is the chapter that we taught on last time I was teaching, chapter 3, about establishing these deacons and pastors and the role of a pastor is, it's, it's good to desire something like that, but it comes with a huge responsibility. See, not just to the body, but also to the Lord. The consequences of a pastor's actions are also just as huge. See, if a pastor doesn't stay true to the word of God or is a bad witness, he can cause the body to stumble or leave. And the judgment from God is also more severe on a pastor. Don't think I haven't thought of these things. James 3.1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. I'd be okay with just the normal judgment. I don't want to add stricter judgment. Um, But Paul singled out pastors, teachers, and deacons, indicating that their work is of utmost importance in the church. See, those who are called to this ministry need to carry out their duties in a praiseworthy manner. We also saw that God has called you to be a part of his family, and each one of us has been given a part to play in sharing that good news. Whether you're a deacon, a leader, or not, we all have been told to go and share the good news about Jesus Christ. So you don't need to be in leadership to share him with others. And in this next chapter, the one we're getting into today, Paul is again dealing with the body and the apostasy, the the falling away that is happening, and he's going to continue... to address this issue here in Ephesus. See, apostasy means to abandon your faith, to fall away from following the Lord. Uh, They've turned their back on him. So that's what he's addressing here today in chapter four. So let's pick it up there. First Timothy chapter four, verse one says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So he starts off and he says, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, there's going to be people that depart from the faith. They're going to they're going to listen to these deceiving spirits. They're going to pay attention to this doctrine of demons. It's going to be clear Somehow, we don't know how, the Spirit expressly spoke to Paul, or maybe it was through his word, that there's going to be these people that are going to fall away. He spoke in such a way there was no misunderstanding. The Spirit said that there's coming a time when some will depart from the faith. Now, we aren't sure how he got this message from the Spirit. Is he referring to Old Testament prophecies, or if the Spirit actually spoke to Paul directly? But it's interesting that the apostles were sharing the word of God and going into all the world just like they were told to do, but the Spirit has already revealed that there would be a falling away from the faith. I think this would be discouraging. You know, I'm doing my best to share the Lord with others, but at the same time, I'm being told that these people are going to fall away, that they're not going to follow. I think it would break your heart. I think it would break Paul's heart. He spoke to the leaders in Ephesus about this falling away on the shores of Miletus. He was in a hurry to get by. And in Acts 20, it says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So Paul knows beforehand what's going to happen. He knows that there's going to come into the church these teachers 
these false wolves or these wolves in sheep's clothing that were there, they're going to be trying to drag the people away. See, this latter time that he speaks of, it doesn't mean during the tribulation period. It's not like it's down the road, this latter time. Because what happens is it's actually speaking of the time between Jesus' ascension and the time before he comes back, this latter time. We're actually living in this latter time. See, it says, in a little while, people will depart from the faith. But we know that's already happened. Because as you've been going through this letter with me, uh, he's written uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells us, Hymenaeus and Alexander have left the faith. See, it's happened during Paul's day, and there's a falling away in ours also. See, one of the things that has stirred up the church uh, recently was a report about the falling away of young people. And one of the hardest hit is the college age. See, they're, they're not coming to the church like they used to. But it's not just church attendance, but it's the society as a whole is turning away from following the Lord. Did you know that one-fifth of Americans say they have no religious affiliation according to Pew Research? I like looking at statistics every now and then. Uh, there's this Gallup poll that put out uh, on March 29th, just a, a little bit ago, less than a, not very much, uh, that half of all Americans attend any type of church. I think it's like a week and a half, but uh, they don't attend any church. Less than half attend any church. They don't go to a synagogue. They don't go to a mosque. They don't go to anything. It's not like they just don't come to a, a Christian church. They don't go anywhere. But if departing from the faith is a sign of the latter times, then we've been living in them for a long time now because people continue to fall away. It's not that there's just going to be a falling away, but they're going to be turning to something else. They're going to be listening to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now, I look up a lot of things trying to make sure I have the simplest explanation. A doctrine. A doctrine is a teaching or instruction. And there can be good and there can be bad teachings. The doctrines of demons, then, are things that demons would teach. And what this doctrine is, is a way to follow God that would go against what his word already tells us. It's a false teaching designed to make you feel like you've earned God's approval. You feel good about your relationship, but you're really not pleasing the Lord. You feel good because you've done something. It's uh, that feeling that you've earned his forgiveness because of the punishment you've inflicted on yourself. You know, I, I really, I messed up, and so I wore sackcloth and ashes. I, I put ash on my head. I, I didn't eat for a week. I, I inflicted this, this punishment on myself, and now I feel better because I've disciplined myself. It's all about what you can do. Now, the religious leaders, if you remember during Christ's time, were great at doing this. You know, they went and eat, and, and they'd walk around uh, in this sackcloth and ashes, and everybody would go, oh, how spiritual that person is. But Jesus said their hearts were far from him, and their father was the devil. So Timothy has been sent to remove the false teachers from the body that are already there, and these false teachers uh, that are in his church, Jesus had spoke about. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, it speaks about this. And so I find it interesting when Jesus speaks to a specific church that has started after he went to be with the Lord. It says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. See, they've left the faith, they've fallen. The encouraging thing, though, that I see in this is that they're not lost because he says, repent, turn back, do those first things again. See, there are people who are walking away from the faith every day, but they're not lost yet. Paul wrote in Galatians 1, uh, chapter, or 1, verse 6, he says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into the gospel of grace to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. See, he's surprised that they were turning away so quickly. And he warns them that even if an angel was to reveal a new way to come to God, let them be cursed. Don't listen. This would be a doctrine of demons. 
This is be what we're not supposed to be paying attention to. And in our day and age, there are religions that have been established because an angel said something or did something. See, this is the kind of false teaching Paul is fighting against. He goes on and says that those who have turned from the faith have had their consciences hardened or seared to the things of God. It says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Paul is not a stranger to having a hard heart. Um, if you know much about his life, he had persecuted the Christians. He felt totally justified in doing it, even consenting to their death. I think that would be a hard heart, not listening to the Lord. See, people's heart can become hardened by this false teaching. The worst part is that they have turned their backs on the Lord, and in their thoughts they feel right in what they are doing. See, seared can mean branded or carterized. See, they have a tough, burnt callousness towards the work of the Spirit in their lives. Their consciences, which at one time would have been convicted about their sins, now doesn't reply much at all. It's just this dull, this numb kind of voice in the back of their head, I guess, that they, they don't listen to because they haven't been listening to it. They've grown numb. See, they also forbid to marry, and they also say you're not supposed to be eating certain things but what this is is just a list of man-made rules to make you feel more holy or feel justified in what you're doing. But they did nothing to deal with your sin. What they did do was make someone feel like they, they've accomplished something that God will be pleased with them because of what they're doing. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 says, These things indeed have the appearance of wisdom. They look good in self-imposed religion false humility, and neglect of the body, but they're of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. Our, our sinful desires are the big issue here. In the last days, it says, some will depart from the faith. They will leave the truth of God's word and give in to this false teaching. And we know that that's already happened. They're going to listen to the doctrines of demons, but they're not only going to leave the truth, but it says that they're going to teach others to follow. They're going to teach others these false doctrines that they've heard. And I think that should be as a, a warning to us because lots of times we take in things and we share it with others, but we don't check whether it's actually true or not. And so we start sharing it with somebody else. And there's a danger that we could cause somebody to stumble because we're sharing this stuff and we don't really know where it came from. That's why we need to be in his word. We need to know what the word of God says to study it, to see if these things line up with his word. In verse 4, he goes on, he says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. See, we see that false religion that had crept in the church, it has a Jewish feel to it, a Jewish influence, because they were the ones that had these strict laws about what you could and could not eat. And here Paul says, if you receive this food with thanksgiving, then it's made kosher, it's made holy, it's right, uh, because you've prayed for it, because you've received it from him. The list of what cannot be eaten no longer applies. See, God's given us his permission to eat these animals. Now you could say there are laws in the Old Testament that say you're not supposed to eat these things, but that doesn't apply anymore. And if you want to go even further, go back to Genesis chapter 9, the very first book in the Bible. It says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So what's off limits there? And it's not that in the garden, God didn't give everything as food, and then later he changed his mind. But this has been the case. For the Jews, they had a different rule. See, Peter, in a vision in Acts chapter 10, if you remember, the sheet was let down in front of him, and it had all kinds of things in there. I imagine it had bugs and, and rodents and all kinds of things in there. And God tells him to rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, ah, no, I, I'm, I've never eaten anything that's unclean, unkosher. I don't eat these kind of things. But God told Peter, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And he's referring to people. But... I believe it also applies to food. Here we have, in the scriptures that we're reading today, 
that we can eat these things. Every creature of God is good. You don't have to feel guilty if you like bacon. It doesn't mean everything we eat is good for us, though, but that we have permission to eat it. God has provided for us, and what we should do is always pray and thank him for that provision. He goes on and he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the word of faith and of the good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So one of Timothy's tasks, one of the things he's been given to do as overseer of this church is to instruct the body in the word of God and help them to understand how to apply it to their lives. See, Paul has warned Timothy of the apostasy, the falling away, the false teaching that had already come, and the only way to help this body of believers not follow those who are leaving the faith is to instruct them in God's word. What's the answer? It's God's word. See, if he does that, then they will be nourished. They'll be fed in the word of faith and good doctrine. So in order to be that good minister, Timothy needs to be fed himself. He needs to know what the word says. He can't give the things of God unless he has first spent his time in the word. That way he can help them to know God's word. So when someone brings in a false teaching, they'll be able to spot it. They'll go, no, that, that's not right. That's not what it says. Now, I don't see one thing in this chapter that I could say isn't for today. Yeah, this is great for back then, but all of these things apply for us today. There's still a falling away that's happening. There are false religions, and it's just as important, or even more so, I would say, that we teach the Word of God, spend the time in His Word, not only for teaching like we're doing here, but also for ourselves. See, this applies to me in all kinds of ways. I think this chapter speaks to me in multiple different areas, but you guys aren't off the hook. See, God has given me gifts to help me do the ministry he has called me to do, and you've been given gifts that go along with the ministry you've been called to, gifts that help you in this area. The comforting thing is that it's all God's responsibility to do the work in us. He's given you gifts to do it, but it's his responsibility to do the work in us. We weren't called because we have anything to offer him. It's not because I have this huge list of qualifications, but we just daily put him first and allow him to minister through us. He goes on and he says, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. See, Paul described this false teaching as nothing more than old wives' tales, just man's ways of coming to God when the focus actually needed to be on the Word of God and not man's made-up ideas. See, Timothy is encouraged to teach the body to reject this false teaching and to make sure he is paying attention to his own walk. If you know, Timothy is half Greek, he's half Jewish. he's, He's a mix. And he was raised knowing the Scriptures. His dad was a Greek, his mom a Jew, and they shared with him the Word of God. This message wasn't just for those in the body, but it's for him as well. It says, not only do I need to be in the Word so I can prepare for a Bible study, I need to be exercising reading the Word for my own spiritual growth. I need to put forth the effort to grow myself as much as I put in to prepare to teach. And if I'm honest, I spend a huge amount of time studying to make sure that I can prepare a message and try to teach it as accurately as possible, more so than I do just reading it for myself. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's foundations of faith afterwards. I got midweek Bible study, youth groups coming up. Uh, May, I have, a, I have a month. But, you know, there's going to be a couple of Bible studies in between then. Teaching on Sunday, teaching on Thursday. And so I'm always preparing for something else. So when I sit down to read God's word, it's like, okay, how does that apply to this study? Instead of how does that apply to me? But I need to put in that time, not just preparing for a study, but to grow myself. And we all need to be doing the same exact thing, spending that time knowing his word so that we can grow. Paul writes something very similar to Titus, his other disciple. He says in Titus chapter 1, it says, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, 
not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth, but to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their minds and consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. See, Titus is dealing with the same issue in his church, a falling away. And Paul gives a, a, a stern warning here, and the consequences, they're, they're heavy. Those who follow these false teachings have turned from the truth. Their consciences are defiled, and even though they claim to know God, their actions show they don't. See, there is this, this rejecting of the Spirit when he reveals something to you, when he says what you're doing is a sin and you choose to do it anyways, and you reject that, you become hardened to the things of the Spirit, to the things of God. And so Paul's warning against this because you do it long enough and you're going to turn and you're going to walk away. He says in verse 8, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So talking about exercise, we know that it's beneficial. It's good for your health. It's good for your physique. It puts on muscle. Uh, you know, you, you look a lot better. You feel a lot better when you're doing the exercise. But he says, godliness is profitable in every aspect of your life, not just for your physique and your health. Godliness is profitable in everything Someone is training like an athlete makes the event he is training for his main goal. But how much energy, effort, time, and dedication do you think an Olympic athlete puts into his training? His sport is his life. Paul tells Timothy, exercise is good. It's not that it's a bad thing. It's beneficial. But he needs to train like an athlete. And instead of training for a sport, you're working to live your life, to line your life up with God's Word. Are you training like an athlete, like an Olympian, to make your walk line up with Him, to get into His Word, to draw closer to Him? See, exercise is good, but what's even better is godliness. Now, godliness means to have the character or heart of God in you. A godly person does those things that please God. One person translated or defined godliness as God-likeness. See, he's completely devoted to him, the person who wants to be godly. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 5, it says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're to exercise, to be more like God, to have the mind of Christ in you. See, this godliness that we need to have comes with a promise. Did you see that in there? It comes with the promise of a better life. Not that every problem is gone and everything is easy, but there's contentment and there's a peace, a peace that you may never have had before, a peace that only he can give. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine living life without this because without the Lord, my life was heading downhill fast. But he turned it around, and I can't imagine any other way to live because there is this peace, there is this confidence. What promise does this world have to offer? What do you get from it? There's nothing that can take your sins away and give you eternal life. There's nothing that says you are forever secure. See, sin robs you of life here and it's gonna rob you of your life later. You can chase after money or fame, get all the education you can or live to please your flesh. You can take drugs and live for sex, but in the end, it destroys you and the life God wants for you. See, godliness comes with a promise, a promise of a better life, and here in the future, it profits us in all things, and all means all. See, as you draw close to God, as you grow in your relationship with Him, He produces this godliness in your life. 
Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, I may not feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing or I'm going down the right road and I'm frustrated and the enemy is just whispering in my ear and I'm just going along and, and agreeing with him. Yeah, I'm a bad guy. Yeah, I did that wrong. And I, yeah, you're right. I don't deserve that. And I just, I get on the roller coaster. Me and the enemy have a blast kicking my butt. But that's not what the Lord would say. And when you stop and you think, the Lord's doing a work in my life. He's doing a work in your life. And he's going to be faithful to complete it. See, how can we become more godly? Now, I, I've written up three ways that we can become more godly, and I'm sure you could find some more. But first one, you surrender your life to God, and you live for him. See, he becomes the one in the driver's seat of your life. You stop living for yourself and your sinful desires. See, through faith in Jesus, sin is no longer our master doesn't have to control you. And the third one is you start growing in your knowledge of him and all that he has done for you. You do this by seeking him through prayer and through his word. You learn of him. You draw closer to him. See, our part is to exercise. Our part is to labor in drawing close to him. But God produces the fruit in our lives. He produces the godliness in us. Verse 9 goes on and it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. See, Timothy had come under some attack. And Paul writes and says, We both labor and have suffered reproach. We've both been under attack. And sometimes it's just good to know you're not alone. See, the enemy wants you to feel like this can be the only thing. It's only happening to you. You're the only one that this happens to. Sometimes I can think I must be doing everything wrong because I have someone who will come up and tell me, you're doing everything wrong. And they just want to help me become a better pastor. I heard the pastor say after a hard week that he just wanted to give up and head to the hills with his quads and his guns and go play. But I'm glad he never did. I took comfort knowing I wasn't the only one wanting to give up sometimes. And at those times, we need to be praying for our pastor because he's letting you in on a little secret. He's struggling. The enemy's having a heyday with him. See, this reproach usually comes from someone in the body. It can happen outside, but usually comes from within. See, there are a lot of people who won't step out and share Jesus Christ with others because they're worried. What will they think? What will they say? So they don't say anything then every Sunday you have your pastor standing up and sharing Jesus. He comes under attack, and I would encourage you to be praying for Brad. Be praying for us, because he needs all the prayer you can give him. The strength we have to stand up, even when reproached, is that we serve the living God. The message we have is the most important message anyone can share. We have a Savior who gave his life for everyone, but only those who believe will receive the promise. So we share with them so that they will believe. If we make sure to teach the word of God, then whether we are reproached or not, we know we're laboring for him and not for ourselves. See, the message we have to give is the only one that offers hope and eternal life. The message of Jesus Christ is more important than the attack that tries to hold you back. So don't be afraid to share the gospel. Don't be afraid to say the name of Jesus Christ because there is no other name given to men by which we must be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 11 says, These things command and teach. See, this is his mission, what he has been called to do, and Timothy is not to hold back from teaching the full counsel of the Word of God, whether he suffers for it or not. He isn't to steer around certain subjects, but to teach them and let the Word of God do the work in the hearts of the people. See, knowing that as he shares the Word, God does the work to convict, to restore that it's his work and not his own, takes a huge burden off. Like Paul has already said, if he does this, he will be a faithful minister to the call God has placed on his life. And he says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So apparently, Timothy faces opponents who refuse to take him seriously because he's a young man. 
or he himself is afraid that his age will make his ministry ineffective. See, because of his age, he's encouraged to work harder at being that example to the body. Work harder. Labor more. Now, I wouldn't say Timothy was a youth. It's possible that he's in his mid-30s at this time. So I don't know if I'd, I'd consider him a, a young man. But during the time he lived in, you were considered a youth until you were 40. So to help Timothy, he needed to pay close attention to the things he said, how he acted, and be that example to the body in love, in spirit, in faith, and in a pure life as he lived before them. That way, when he taught, there would be as little as possible to distract them from the message he shared. I'm not a youth. I've cleared the 40 mark. But I still have growing to do. See, being young, I'm sure, brought a lot of reproach his way. Reproach isn't fun. See, dealing with angry people who put down the teaching and challenge the message is very difficult. Paul said, let no one despise you because of your youth. He's not giving him permission to get in their face when they stand up and start talking about him because he's young. Don't let them despise you. Put them in their place. Make them sit back down. That's not what he's saying. Instead, I believe Paul is saying, don't take what people may say about you to heart. Don't let them get a hook in you. See, if you're an example in the way you live, there will be nothing they can say against your teaching. His lifestyle, the example he set for those watching, was to be a continual example. Not only when he was teaching, but with his personal life also. He needed to be on the job 24-7. See, the moment he didn't, someone could say, and you call yourself a pastor. Did you know that 35 to 40% of pastors leave within the first five years? And it says that 60 to 80% of those who enter the ministry will not stay, will not be in it in 10 years. That's a huge dropout rate. I'd encourage you guys to be praying for Brad, be praying for me, be praying for Paul. He goes on and he says, Till I come, give attention to the reading, to the exhortation, to doctrine. See, three things Timothy is to pay attention to. He needs to read the word, he needs to be exhorting, and he needs to be paying attention to the teaching. See, I'd wondered what they read. You know, do they just have a letter that they carry around? What do they read? See, he didn't have a Bible like we do, so he would be reading the Jewish writings. We just call them the Old Testament. But after Alexander the Great conquered much of the known world, the Greek language became the common language. And over time, Jews outside of Jerusalem ceased to understand Hebrew. They only got the Greek. So they had to come up with a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And it was commissioned uh, to do this, and it was translated by 72 different scribes and was called the Septuagint. Maybe you've heard that word. Well, that's what it is. That's what they had. The Septuagint means 70. So by the time of Christ, this is what he would be reading. It was the translation used throughout the Mediterranean. So Timothy had the Hebrew scriptures that he would read from. And we know that Jesus was handed a scroll during a service in Nazareth, and he read from the prophet Isaiah. He most likely read from the Septuagint. So he was reading the word. He also needed to give his attention to exhortation, which means to give a word of encouragement. The word would be read, and then Timothy was to encourage the believers in the Lord, encourage them to follow, encourage them to step out, exhort them. Acts 13, 15 says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, this is what happened with the disciples. The rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they just read the word of God and they said, do you have a word of encouragement or exhortation for the people? Go ahead, speak, share with us. See, finally, Timothy is to give his attention to teaching. We have the reading of God's word, the encouragement, and finally the teaching. See, the pastor needs to be the first one in the word of God and bringing the word of God before the people. Then he can comfort and teach through it. What Paul is telling Timothy is all based on God's word. You take away the word and you just have inspirational stories. What else would you hear on a Sunday? You know, we need to be good humans to one another 
and be kind to each other. There's no, there's no substance. It's just a good story. See, this is not just what Timothy needs to do for the body, but he needs to do it for himself as well. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Each one of us has been given gifts to help us in the ministry, like I've said. God has called us to. Looking at this verse, it is possible to neglect the gifts God has given you. Because that's what he said, don't neglect it. If God has given me the gift of teaching, it is possible for me to not want to teach. I'm not forced to teach. I could say no, and I could not use the gift he's given me. And you've been given a gift to help you in the ministry. Romans says in chapter 12, So we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing, according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If you've got the gift of prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There are more gifts talked about in the scripture, but he says that you guys have one of them, and it's for use in the body. Maybe you have more than one. Maybe you have a couple. Maybe you have three of them, four of them. I don't know. But are you neglecting the gift that's been given to you? Or are you using it? You just go about your daily life not even thinking about it. Are you laboring like an athlete? Second Timothy 1.6 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. We had a, a potluck one time, and my wife had a potato soup. And I was in charge of stirring, and I got distracted. And so then I was told, do not stir the soup, because it is all burnt. We have this gift in us that God says we are supposed to stir up. Don't just let it settle. Don't let it become calloused. But stir it up. Get it working. Bring it back to life. Mix it in. See, he says that he's been given a gift, Timothy was, by the laying on of hands. There was this time where the elders of the church prophesied that God was going to use Timothy in a special way for the church. Then they all came together, placed their hands on this young man, and prayed for him. So to encourage Timothy, Paul reminds him of this time and the gift he was given, most likely at that time. See, this happened to me. There was a laying on of hands, and some of you guys were there. And when I think back about that time, I think... All I know is that God called me because I wasn't striving on my own. And if that's all I know, then I'm going to continue to move forward doing what he's called me to do. Because if I didn't know he called me, I'd be going, maybe I'm doing this in my own steam. If that's not the case. Verse 15 says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Timothy doesn't have an off day. Every day he has to be in the Word. Every day he has to be setting that example. See, the study of God's Word, the gift he has given, are to help Timothy in the work he's called to do. He isn't to attempt to do these things, but to practice them, think about them, care about them, give himself entirely to them, 100%, wholeheartedly, nothing left back. And by focusing and meditating on the word, his life will be changed. As he uses the gifts given to him and teaches the body, their lives will be changed. And the evidence of what God is doing in his life will be easily seen by anyone who is watching. You guys have watched me grow up a lot. I grew up in this church. If you gave yourself entirely to following the Lord and reading his word, it would be evident to everyone that something has changed in you. Now, Timothy is overseeing a lot of things in Ephesus. He's dealing with false teachers, appointing elders and deacons in the body. You would think that Timothy has already arrived, but there's still growth taking place in his life as he does the work of ministry. The last verse, it says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. See, every pastor, every one of us, must examine constantly these two areas in our lives. How is your walk? 
you know better than I. Maybe we could see how your walk's doing some days when you're heavy hearted and your face is hanging and you're just having a rough day. How is your walk? How are you doing with the Lord? Are you getting in his word? Are you growing? Are you sharing the good news with others? How are you doing with sharing the most wonderful news in the world? How are you doing telling other people about it? Are you worried about a reproach? Are you worried about what others will say? See, if Timothy fails to do this, it's going to hurt himself. But it's also going to hurt the people in his congregation, the people that he's sharing with. It's going to hurt the body there in Ephesus. See, without paying attention to his walk, Timothy might suffer shipwreck. 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul had already talked to him about this. He says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the, promise, the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered, suffered shipwreck. See, if he fails to accurately teach the word, others are going to suffer. His main focus was to be studying and teaching. If he will do this, the growth in his life is going to be easily seen. See, we've been living in the last days for some time now. These are the last days. There's not days after this. There's not a new age. The age of grace, we live in it. God has been gracious and merciful to us. But one of these days, it's going to end. The question isn't if we are living in the last days, but how much longer do we have? I don't know, but if I told you the time was short and you believed me, you would be living your life a lot differently. See, Paul believed the time was very short, and the message he gives to Timothy in this letter is the most important thing he can share. See, if Jesus is going to return soon, if it's right around the corner, if you're following after the Lord giving 100%, there's nothing to worry about. You don't have to worry about your walk because you're constantly drawing close to him. But if you're not, I would encourage you to get right with him. Ask him for forgiveness. Turn from your sins and draw close to him again. Because I do believe we're very close. I don't believe we have very much time left. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today, Lord. I thank you for just encouraging us to get into your word, Lord, that we would be doing that personal examination of ourselves, Lord, in our relationship with you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have that godly exercise, Lord. And Father, I just want to pray for the people that may be here tonight or this morning, Father, that are um, just on the fence. Maybe they've never asked you into their life. Maybe they don't have the power, Father, that you offer them to have victory over their sins, Lord. If there is someone out here today that needs you in their life, that wants to give their life to you, Father, I pray, Lord, you just have them lift up their hand so we can pray for them. Don't want to embarrass them. Don't, I'm not going to ask them to come to the front. I just want to pray for you. If you're here today and you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, just lift up your hand. If there's anybody here today that is struggling in some of these areas, you don't give it 100% and you want to. You want us to pray for you. Would you lift up your hand? Thank you there. Thank you there. Thank you there. Thank you back there. Thank you over there. Thank you over there. Thank you. Thank you there. Thank you over there. Thank you back there. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Father, I want to lift these guys up. Lord, they recognize that there is an area that they're struggling with and they want help. I don't know if they've fallen or if it's just some other area, Lord, but you do. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the strength to have victory over this area, Lord, that you would comfort them in the midst of this, Lord, that you'd go before them, Father, and uh, put them back on the right track, Lord. We just want to lift them up to you, Father. We give you this day, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.